Welcome to In the Name of the Law with your host, Lisa Speaker from Speaker Law Firm. Joining her today is Stephen Sinus from Sinus Dramus Law Firm, along with Mary Chartier and Takura Niemfakusa from Chartier Niemfakusa PLC. Now let's discuss some remarkable stories and real cases. Welcome to In the Name of the Law. Today we're gonna to talk about a tragic divorce case that ended in murder-suicide. We'll also talk about the Brittany Griner case and sentencing disparities in the United States and how to handle semi-truck accident cases. In the Name of Family Law. We have been seeing lots of tragic news stories involving gun violence, and that is no less of a concern in the context of domestic relations, where there's divorce litigation and custody litigation, and somebody ends up killing a family member. Today I have with us family law attorney Nancy Gallagher. She is an attorney at the Gallagher Everett Law Firm and practices in Gratiot County, Isabella County, Clinton County, and Saginaw County, and I think Montcalm County too. And she's gonna share with us uh, uh, the story of one of her clients who suffered a tragic end um, due to gun violence during the context of a divorce case. Nancy, thank you for being here today. Yeah, these are, are very difficult issues, but like every family law attorney, domestic violence is part of what we deal with. Um, the case that happened in July um, was an extreme version of, of what so many family attorneys deal with. I had a client who I had known for several years. I had represented her in a custody matter in Gratiot County. Um, I had known her since about 2017 or 18. She was married at the time. Um, she did not have children with her second husband, or with her husband, and she had a child from her first relationship that was 13 years old. She um, had survived domestic violence in her early relationship more than a decade ago and had really done so well for herself and her child. Her child was everything. She was working, when I met her, as a nurse's aide. She became an LPN, then she became an RN, and then she got a bachelor's in nursing and was in July in the midst of a dual master's degree program at Purdue, getting an MNA and an MBA. Had a great job, owned her house, was, was really a successful person. You know, we get to know people in custody cases and, and I liked her, she was feisty, um, hardworking, and I didn't know her husband. Um, he was not part of the case that we were dealing in. She came to our county for those, for that matter, it was a legal custody issue. Um, so when she contacted me in June, I had talked to her in the intervening years about some other issues involving her child. She contacted me in June. Um, she had discovered an infidelity on the part of her husband. She wanted a divorce. Um, I told her I didn't go to Ross Common County where she lived and that was too far, she should get someone there. Talked to her about, you know, whether she was safe, whether what was going on, um, and didn't hear from her. She was at that time gonna go to co marriage counseling mm -hmm. at the husband's request. So I heard from her late June. She said, would you please do it? This should be a simple divorce. We don't have any children. I own the house. We don't have a lot together, it, so she talked me into it. And I think her primary concern at that time, she didn't want to spend a lot of money on a divorce. Um, she knew what custody issues were, and that was a separate animal. She didn't have to deal with that, fortunately. And she was kind of a take charge kind of person. I think she even considered doing it herself. So again, she was expressing problems that uh, he had just recently gotten out of the house. She was having trouble getting him to leave. He just wouldn't take no for an answer. He was blowing up her phone. And we had the conversation that I think family law attorneys have with their client. Are you safe? You know, promise me you'll call the police if something happened. Um, 
And again, she had this very strong woman, tough demeanor that I, I think is disarming to some of us. And, and I think, I don't think either one of us realized the danger she was in. So I, um, she finally gave me the go to, to start her divorce. We uh, didn't even need her to come in and sign. It was a divorce without kids. I signed her complaint, communicated a little by email. It was just a very simple complaint. We, we mailed it up to uh, the court in, in Ross Common County on, um, I believe it was July 1st because of the holiday weekend. We, we were checking to see when it got there because she wanted to know when it would be filed. It was filed on Thursday. Uh, I think it was the 7th. My office talked to her on the phone, one of my assistants. Um, she expressed the fact that she really wanted him, she really wanted an order saying he couldn't come to her house. And, and how does he get the copy of the complaint? That he hasn't did not. happened yet. That hasn't okay. happened okay. yet. We hadn't gotten it back from the court, but we called her and said, hey, it's been filed. Because if you practice law in rural areas, you can't assume that people don't know everybody knows because everybody. there's a network. Yes, I've had this happen. I had this happen early on where, you know, someone that we didn't want to know knew before he was served um, because his sister worked at the clerk's office unbeknownst mm -hmm. to me. So that, that happened. So we were checking. Um, and again, she, she we, my assistant told her, well, she, she mentioned to my assistant that she had tried to get a PPO and was denied. And my assistant said, you know, we can file for a, a motion to get exclusive possession of the house so we can't come back because he was just calling her nonstop. And she said, Nancy, I want to see what you filed in your PPO and what was denied. So she was going to get all that to us. We had also sent her the financial disclosure forms and things like that. So that was Thursday, um, again, the week after the 4th. On Saturday, she apparently filled out all those forms and she emailed copies of her PPO petition, the denial, with her financial disclosure forms Saturday afternoon. Um, she lived at Houghton Lake with her 13-year-old son previous relationship and her mother had been staying with her because mom was in a car accident in May and Tyranny was a RN and was helping out her mom and I believe she was her mother's only child so she was helping out her mom um, they were staying there sometime during the night of Saturday I'm not even exactly sure what time the police report still has not been issued um, the husband who had been staying with his mother apparently went to his mother's house, said he needed a gun. You know, again, we haven't seen the report. This is informal knowledge that because the sheriff's department has kept in touch with the family. Um, left his mother's house and said he was something to the effect that he was going to go kill the F. Mm -hmm. So he left the house of his mother. I don't know the distances between all these homes. Apparently the mother then went to his father's house, her ex-husband's house. No one called 911. Um, they apparently then went to a friend's house and all of that took a while and something like 45 minutes later the friend got to the marital home to find four people dead and shot. Yeah. So your client, her mother, her son, her child, and, and then, and then he shot himself. So let's, um, before we run out of time, I want to make sure, you know, the, the point I think that you've conveyed to me is that in a divorce case, when somebody's expressing self-harm, yes. there's a high risk to not only that person, but the people in their life. And yes. it seems like judges maybe don't understand that especially non-family law judges, don't seem to understand that aspect of, well, of and, the danger. And again, um, a lot of us don't understand it. You know, there there are so many situations where someone is, is threat. If, if you're threatening to kill yourself because of the end of a relationship that you don't want to end, and that's the primary focus, that other person is also in danger by definition. So 
that that is um, I think I think what what strikes me in all of these things it's it's the need to pay attention to not just the violence that happens in the past, but what's the mindset now. Right. None of us have a crystal ball, including judges, and I understand that. But uh, you know, and the what ifs are going to keep coming. You know, what if, um, what if it, it would a PPO have made any difference? Right. Well, thank you for sharing um, your client's tragic story with us, and hopefully, you can help other people. That's the goal. In the Name of Family Law is brought to you by Speaker Law Firm. In the Name of Personal Injury Law. Semi-truck accidents are sudden and traumatic, and people are very seriously injured oftentimes. They need to learn how to face a new life with their injuries, but they also need to know how to pursue their legal rights. Today we have Steve Sinus of the Sinus Dramus Law Firm to talk to us about how to pursue a semi-truck accident case. Thanks for having me. Welcome back. So, um, it's great that you're here. And what are the first steps to handling a semi-truck accident case when it comes into your firm? Well, uh, whatever the, the situation is, we want to take action. Uh, and the action we take can be affected uh, based on how long it's been uh, since the crash when the person comes into our firm. If uh, someone contacts our firm and has just been injured in a semi-truck accident, uh, we'll want to get out to the scene uh, as soon as we can to collect as much evidence as we can. Uh, there are important um, uh, things about the roadway to look at, whether there's skid marks. Uh, you can determine perhaps where the point of impact was between the two vehicles, so you can learn a lot about the crash by getting out to the scene. Uh, but if several weeks have gone by, several months, and the person's coming in finally looking for a lawyer, uh, going to the scene doesn't tell us that much. So then we then have to request as much as we can from local police departments that investigated the crash, uh, get as much information that might be out there through other insurance companies or maybe the truck com trucky company that investigated the crash. Because that's the thing. These trucking companies get out there immediately, immediately right? right? They have to. They have to, and they send their people before anyone else can get there. So we try our best to get as much information as we can, but the, the sooner somebody retains us, the more we can uh, gather in terms of evidence for them. Uh, so that's really important. Uh, and then we go on through an analysis trying to determine what parties might be at fault. And what people should understand is that when you have a semi-truck accident, you have the driver who maybe was driving negligently. Uh, that driver can be held liable, uh, but their employer can be held liable. The owner of the semi-truck can be held liable. Sometimes there are different owners uh, of the truck and the trailer. Uh, so you have to examine that relationship. There might be leasing agreements on the truck. Some, some entity might own the truck and lease it to another entity. Uh, there could even be theories to hold shippers uh, liable who loaded up the truck depending on the nature of the crash. So there's a lot that goes into that preliminary analysis determining which party is at fault. And then once we determine uh, what parties are at fault, what individuals are at fault, we put them on notice by sending them letters explaining uh, that we, we represent the person and asking them to preserve all evidence. So help me understand, is it, you, you act really quickly in these cases to do your investigation. Is that more important in a semi-truck case than it would be for any, any other kind of auto accident? You always wanna be diligent as an attorney, uh, but there are things about a semi-truck case where it requires even more diligence um, or it makes it even more important to be diligent. Uh, first of all, these cases often, as, as you remarked, involve serious injury. So you have a lot riding on these cases and you need to get out there and make sure that you can make a difference for your clients. Uh, and then you, you also have an aggressive opponent on the other side. These trucking companies and their insurance companies, which is really the main entity that defends against the case, they are aggressive and they want to find any information they can to reduce their liability. And so we have to make sure that we work up our cases diligently so we figure out who we can pursue a case against and then be ready to pursue that case because we know that their attorneys are gonna be ready to go when they get their, uh, uh, their job. So does the Michigan no fault law apply to a semi-truck accident case or are there other laws that also apply in this context? So the Michigan no fault law has a huge impact on semi-truck accident cases here in Michigan. Uh, we did a whole other episode about all the ways that the Michigan no fault law plays in these cases. So the answer to your question is the Michigan no fault definitely applies to these cases but also there are many other laws that can apply. 
There is the federal motor, motor carrier regulations that have been adopted by the state of Michigan that set forth all the rules and regulations that truck drivers have to operate by. Uh, there are common law theories of liability that can come from case law and other principles that are uh, 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 enforced under Michigan law. And so when you look at a truck accident case, you have to factor in the Michigan no-fall law. You have to factor in the trucking regulations. There are other safety standards that can apply. So they're a multifaceted case that requires a lot of legal analysis up front so that the case is worked up in the most uh, optimized way and, and with the best strategy. So do you as the attorney representing the injured plaintiff um, need to file a negligence suit right away as well? You sometimes uh, feel the need as an attorney to file a lawsuit right away against the at-fault parties, but you don't have to. You have three years uh, as the statute of limitations that typically applies to these cases to bring legal action. And uh, there are reasons uh, to file a lawsuit right away if you're not getting all the information you need from the at-fault parties. They're not complying with your requests. Uh, you need to you know, have subpoena power uh, through a lawsuit. Uh, so there are times where we file right away, but there are also times where it's in the client's best interest to wait to file a lawsuit. Maybe the client's still treating for their injuries. You don't quite know the nature and extent of their injuries yet. Uh, maybe you have good faith communications going on with the insurance companies involved who want to settle the case, so you don't want to just jump into a lawsuit. Maybe your client just doesn't want to deal with litigation right away because they're injured and they just don't want to be burdened with it. So we never apply a hard and fast rule. We look at each case uh, based on its own facts and circumstances and then file the lawsuit and you just have to do it within three years as the typical rule. And where do you have to go file that negligence suit? Is it the same place as the PIP case? That's another thing that we have to think through. It's called venue, uh, the venue selection. And venue is the word to describe the courts you can choose from to file a lawsuit. And uh, Oftentimes, it can be the county where the crash occurred. You have to file in that circuit court of that county. Uh, but because trucking companies operate in various counties and the way the venue rules work, uh, you may be able to file that lawsuit in various different counties. And so another strategic thing that we have to work up and think through is where would we file the lawsuit once we file it? And venue can be a really important decision. It affects what juries you're going to have in a case, uh, the judge you have in the case, uh, so you have to think through those things as an, uh, as an attorney, for sure. So once a, a lawsuit has been filed, can you tell us a little bit about what happens in the case after that? So some people think that when you file a lawsuit, you're going to court. Uh, what's really happening is that you're filing paperwork with a court uh, that opens up a file, puts the case on its docket, and then uh, has the parties through their attorneys agree to a timeline uh, through which the case is handled. There are deadlines to exchange witnesses, uh, deadlines to conduct depositions, which is questioning people under oath to find out what they might say at trial. Uh, there are deadlines to exchange other discovery requests. Uh, and also uh, there, there are rights that defense has to have our clients evaluated. So all these things have to be worked into a timeline, but the case moves on. It can be aggressively defended by the uh, attorneys for the trucking companies, um, but it's a long process. And so we just tell our clients, you have to you have to be tough and, and, and fight your way through it, but if, if you endure the process, which can usually be pretty uh, bearable, uh, throughout that process, the case may settle um, sometime before trial, and if not, then you have a trial about a year down the road. Okay, so Steve, tell us what the key is for an injured person to have a successful result in their semi-truck accident case. They need to hire an attorney they feel comfortable with, who's skilled and knowledgeable with all aspects of the law. They need to stick to the plan with their attorney and they need to be credible and tell a genuine story about how their injuries have affected their life. And if they do all that, they'll get the best result for themselves. Okay, thank you for your help today. Thank you. In the Name of Personal Injury Law is brought to you by the Sinus Dramus Law Firm. Go to WLAJ.com for more information on today's topics and to view other In the Name of the Law episodes. In the Name of Criminal Defense, Professional basketball player Brittany Greiner was found guilty on drug charges for bringing in less than one gram of cannabis oil into Russia where she was playing professional basketball during the WNBA's offseason. Today we're going to be talking to Mary Chartier and to Courtney Yanfakutsta of Chartier and Yanfakutsta about the Greiner case and the sentencing disparities here in the United States. How did Brittany Greiner end up in this situation and what was she charged with? So Ms. Greiner was playing 
basketball in Russia, even though she also played for the United States, but in the off season. At an airport, her luggage was searched and she had some hashish oil vape cartridges in her suitcase. Now, the amount that they found was less than a gram. And so if you think about a teaspoon, so imagine you're baking and you pull out that teaspoon, it's less than a quarter of a teaspoon. And that's what they found on her. And then she was charged in Russia. And this was also when the Russia and Ukraine conflict um, was really beginning. So did she go to trial? She started trial and then on the advice of her lawyers, she decided to enter a plea and then they really were trying to beg for leniency for her. Okay, so how did that work out for her, Takura? <laughs> well, uh, the judge largely ignored the fact that she entered a guilty plea, also her contributions to Russian basketball. And also, I think it was very significant that her defense team put on evidence that she actually had a prescription uh, for, for this uh, cannabis that she received to help her with chronic pain issues. Um, nine years, that's a long time. <laughs> so do we know if this was an unusual sentence under the circumstances in Russia? Well, uh, the numbers uh, would suggest that it was because about five years is the typical sentence for somebody under similar circumstances. In Russia? In Russia, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. to be clear, yes. And do we think she's go going to serve all nine years or is there a chance that that she will be serving less time than that? Well, we don't know. What we do know for sure is that her defense team has already filed an appeal. And there have been reports previously of uh, an exchange being done. Uh, former U.S. Marine named Paul Whalen was convicted of espionage charges. And also Victor Boot, who was known as the merchant of death uh, for the role that he played uh, in planning to kill U.S. citizens. Uh, he is one of the people who potentially could be the reason that she gets out earlier. So how does Greiner's sentence compare with people that have been convicted in the United States for comparable amounts uh, of illegal substances? Lisa, uh, gentleman in uh, Louisiana, uh, Kevin O'Brien Allen was convicted and sent to prison for life because he sold $20 worth of marijuana to an undercover uh, agent. So it's unlikely here in the United States that as a standalone, having that small amount of hashish oil would result in a nine year sentence. But there are enormous sentencing disparities in the United States. So while I absolutely agree, and I think you do too, that Bet's, uh, Ms. Greiner's sentence was far, far, far too long. We still have so many people in the, the United States who are suffering under extreme sentences and there are enormous sentencing disparities that go on in this country. And actually a group called Citizens for Racial Equity in Washtenaw County released an extensive report in August of 2020. It re revealed in part that African Americans when compared to white people, same circumstances, almost identical, are 30, three zero times more likely to be charged and convicted of certain crimes and receive longer sentences. And uh, this was an analysis of a thousand cases that spanned seven years, Lisa. A similar study in Ingham County uh, from 2021 showed that the Ingham County Prosecutor's Office was about five times more likely to charge African Americans than white folks. Um, and uh, I think the numbers speak for themselves. <laughs> and I think you also see um, disparities between men and women. So as you know, we do a lot of criminal sexual conduct defense work. And when a man and a woman are convicted of the same offense, for example, a teacher with a student or a person in authority with another young person, the women almost always serve a significantly lower sentence than the men. And so you have this disparity based on race. You also have this disparity based on gender. So how can this problem of sentencing disparity be fixed? It's not gonna be quick or easy because a lot of the reasons that judges rely on for a particular sentence are subjective, right? We can't uh, legislate what people do in their hearts and minds. But I can tell you that one thing that certainly will help is full funding of uh, d public defenders because giving them access to expert witnesses and that sort of thing, investigators who can help them flesh out and do their constitutional duty 
to conduct a full investigation will make a very big difference. And also stopping the war on drugs, because that will ensure that fewer people <laughs> enter the criminal justice system in the first place. And when you look at this war on drugs that Takura talked about, and when you look at the toll it's taken on this nation, I mean, what happens when someone is convicted of an offense and they go to jail or prison is they go into a cage, right? And, and it's nothing less than that or more than that. It is a cage for human beings. So we are taking our fellow citizens and putting them in cages. And rather than that being the rare occurrence, it is a very common occurrence in this country, more common than almost any other country when we look at a population size. And then when they're there, there's very little opportunity for treatment, very little opportunity for counseling. So people get out and they can unfortunately commit the same offense. There are different things that can be legislated. There is in the federal court system, a big disparity between crack cocaine and mm -hmm. cocaine. And that is absolutely racially motivated. In the federal system, there is a, really a prohibition on the government providing witness statements to an individual until they're actually in the middle of trial. They don't have to do that. They don't do that as a matter mm -hmm. of course. That puts the defense on a very different path than if they had the information to begin with. Yeah. And on the National Registry of Exonerations, and we placed four people on that registry in the last five years. These are individuals who were wrongfully convicted and then our team worked on their cases to get them out. These are actually innocent people. You can look, they summarize, the reasons that people are falsely convicted, whether it is flawed eyewitness testimony, faulty science, bad expert work, prosecutorial misconduct, very little, pretty much nothing has been done in the state to address those issues. For example, we know that incentivized witnesses, also known as jailhouse informants or snitches, are motivated by time cuts. They're motivated because they want a shorter sentence or to not get charged rather than really have a tight system on making sure what they say is accurate, their testimony is allowed in court. And we know that that has resulted in so many wrongful convictions. So essentially, very little is being done, but we know it could be done. Well, and you mentioned um, criminal defenders. There's so many people that just don't have really good defense counsel because our right. system is so broken, right, in Michigan especially. Right. right, and public defenders serve a really important role and um, they should be fully funded to the same degree mm -hmm. as prosecutors and they right. frequently are not. Right. And as you know, Lisa, we talk about these issues and more on our podcast, Constitutional Defenders, and that way we can hear what Takur was about to say. Oh, right. Wait. Yes, right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> In the Name of Criminal Defense is brought to you by Chartier Niam Fakusa PLC. Thank you for joining us on In the Name of the Law. See you next week. Thank you for joining us today for In the Name of the Law. Please go to WLAJ.com for more information on today's topics. And please join us next week for another informative show. Speaker Law Firm fights for you. When you think all is lost, call us. We are determined, compassionate, and strategic. We are award-winning appellate attorneys. If you are ready to fight on, call us and we'll give you frank advice about your prospects for overturning a trial court's decision. Even if you lost in the trial court, we can help. We understand what appellate judges want and we apply top-notch research and writing skills to your case that make the difference on appeal. We are your appellate advocates.